to the book of Jonah, and thanks to you guys who signed up to bring some food, that's going to be a blessing. Jonah's in the Bible somewhere. It's right by Obadiah, which is even more difficult to find. It's almost, it's just a little over halfway. And let's pray. Father, we thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit and his ability to um, minister to our hearts through the word and and stir us up and, and exhort us and instruct us and teach us. We pray that you'd help us to learn the lessons that we can learn from these things that were written beforehand. And I think about how Paul said that these things were written for, for our learning and for our admonition, that we could be charged by these passages and encouraged and strengthened and exhorted, corrected, directed. We thank you, Lord, for that. And we pray that right now your Holy Spirit would stir up our hearts. We need vision, Lord, for these last days in which we live. We need vision for our own lives, vision for uh, our families, vision for uh, our neighborhoods. Lord, we, we have such a a tremendous opportunity, Lord, and we pray for help. We pray that you'd speak to us, uh, we'd be able to gain some insight from the message out of the book of Jonah. And we, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we kind of have been looking at Jonah. We haven't really done a more or less a traditional verse-by-verse look at it. Uh, and I, I think kind of what's been on my heart thinking of this, and again today, and I kind of feel like some of this tonight will be a repeat of the first two, two sessions or two teachings that we had out of Jonah. Uh, there, there are just these tremendous principles uh, in the book of Jonah. They're illustrated here. And I think that they apply uh, to us in, in our time, I think, very directly. Uh, it's not hard to make application uh, when you have somebody who is bringing a message a warning of judgment to a very wicked place that's about to be destroyed. And I I really think that, um, you know, we as the followers of God in the days that we live in, we have to recognize what our opportunities are and what our our calling is and what we may be able to do in in these last days. Uh, The world's a crazy place. It seems to be getting crazier. Uh, Things are happening that you could have thought maybe 20 years ago this would never ever happen and it's happening on a daily basis uh, really and not just in one area but kind of in every area and and I think that it's important for us to not lose sight of um, the fact that while we are citizens of the United States and so got an election coming up you know in a year you need to be praying for your leaders you need to vote there's all these things at one level but first our first citizenship is in heaven and and our opportunities to be involved in what the kingdom of God uh, is doing here on the planet. So important. And I think one of the things that as we, uh, I th- that's just, I think, extremely important for us as Christians is to not become a political party and to not think of uh, our responses um, to the condition of the world that we live in, in in any other way first except for spiritually. We have to first respond spiritually. However else we respond after that can be led by the Spirit. But first, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And Jesus told us how to go forward. We fix our eyes upon Jesus so we can run with endurance the race that's set before us. So uh, we want to be able to do that. And I think Jonah uh, illustrates for us something that that it's, I think we could be, we shouldn't forget, but it seems like we are prone to forget and that is, one of the main messages of the Bible is, is about conversion. Uh, we use the word convert, or conversion. The idea that somebody can change. That's, that's really the hope of the Bible, is that people change. Um, the story of the Bible is, is about a lot of people who didn't change, or they changed very slowly, or the consequences of not listening to God and not letting the change happen. But really, the message of the Bible Apart from God, there isn't going to be any change, but the message from the Word of God is that you can have change and that we, we are to bring a message of hope that will change people's lives. And there, there are these conversions that happen in the book of Jonah. And the first group that we see is the sailors. 
And so let's look again in chapter 1. Um, when the storm comes because of Jonah as he's in the ship, uh, verse 4, the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship was about to be broken up. And then the mariners were afraid and every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. So these men are believers in God. They have gods, but their gods are not the true God. They have all, all manner of gods. And when they go to pray to their gods, they probably have statues that they set up. They probably have some kind of ritual that they learn from somebody that this particular god likes these spices, right? This particular god likes these kind of candles. This particular god wants you to you know, pray in a certain way. Formulas of prayer, rituals of prayer, um, the hoops that you jump through, then this god will respond to you. These are idol worshipers. Uh, they're sailors, um, they are, are world travelers, they're, they're, and you know, sailors in every age are known for their language, how they spend their free time, you know, what are they really all about, they're, that you could, uh, you know, you, it, they're the same today as they've ever been. So that, that's this group of guys. Um, Jonah, though, went to sleep in the boat, verse 5 said, when they were all praying to their gods, Jonah went to the lowest part of the ship and laid down and was asleep. And then verse 6, the captain came to him and said, what do you mean, sleeper, arise and call on your God? Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. And then they said to each other, come let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they seem to be uh, uh, believers in that uh, kind of universal idea of karma. Uh, they probably wouldn't have called it karma. That's a word that's attached to a particular um, philosophy, Buddhist, you know, religion or whatever. But the idea that bad things are happening, some, it must be somebody's fault. The oldest book in the Bible, the book of Job, is dealing with this issue. When Job's friends come and they sit with him quietly for a while, they don't say anything. But then when they finally start talking, what, what do they say? What did you do? <laughs> you did something. It's got to be you. There's got to be. It's just a. It's a human nature thing. It's. It, it's just. It's. It's a. Uh, the Bible teaches us differently. It says Job didn't do anything to deserve it. Um, the Bible doesn't really answer the problem. It just says God allowed it. Um, and God's answer is, where were you when I made everything? And were you going to give me advice? And and God just sort of humbles. Uh, his answer is humility. You know, to give humility. Um, but but these, these guys are, are very worldly in their thinking. It's a very natural way of thinking. It must be somebody's fault. They cast lots. The lot falls on Jonah. And then they said to him, tell us who's uh, causes this trouble upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? He said to them, I'm a Hebrew. I fear the Lord. And that's the word Jehovah. You see the all capitals right there for the word Lord in verse 9. And that means that it's the name of God, Yahweh, or Jehovah, I am, is what the meaning is. I serve the great I am, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And then the men were exceedingly afraid. You could attach, well, obviously, uh, the old saying, there's no uh, atheist in a foxhole, so clearly they're in a storm, they're all going to die, everybody's praying. But there's also uh, the obvious superstition here. Uh, it's somebody's fault, it's your fault, you're what? God gave you a message to go do it, and you went the opposite? Why'd you get on our boat? Why'd you bring this upon us? They're, very, they're idol worshipers, they're superstitious, they're very ignorant of God, they're sailors. Um, they, they said, why have you done this in verse 10? And they knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord because he told them in verse 11, they said, what shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? And the sea was growing more tempestuous. And he said, pick me up and throw me into the sea, and then the sea will be calm for you. And I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land. It's very interesting. He says, just throw me overboard. And they say, we're not going to throw you overboard. They, they just go to work. We'll, we're going to get out of this. We'll work harder. We're not going to throw a guy overboard in the middle of a storm like this. It's interesting, their uh, virtue here. They, they couldn't, though. They couldn't, didn't make the situation any better. The sea, the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they cried out to the Lord, and they said, We pray, O Lord, and notice they cried out to the Lord. Now they've, they're praying to Jehovah. They've realized 
Their gods didn't answer. Their gods couldn't do anything. And this could still be, in some sense, uh, a mark of superstition. It's, it's a historical narrative. We don't have a commentary on it. But they, they do cry out to God, the true God, the living God. And they say, we pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life. Do not charge us with innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it has pleased you. And then they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. But notice verse 16, then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Many times it's in a storm in life that a difficulty happens to people or an awareness of the foolishness of their gods, the emptiness of their, their philosophy that, you know, bad things are happening, what's happening, and trying to understand it from some perspective. And then there's some revelation of God in the middle of it. And now you think, uh, you know, maybe some of these guys didn't stick with the Lord, but I would have to imagine some of them, you'll probably see them in heaven. <laughs> the sailors that were on the boat with Jonah, they're like, you know, I followed the Lord the rest of my life. <laughs> I made a trip back to Jerusalem to learn more about this God who could control the sea. And, and uh, you know, you just don't know. You know, the 10 lepers that were cleansed, they all 10 had the miracle. How many of them really came back? You know, and it, it was just the one. Um, there were many people that, in the, when Jesus fed the 5,000 and they followed him, and, and how many of them were left when Jesus began to reveal who he really was. So obviously, many of these guys maybe didn't believe. We can't say one way or the other, but clearly something happens to them. There's a revelation of God through all of this to these guys that are complete heathens. They're... Um, lost. They don't have any knowledge of God. But through this, they are, they're at the end of the, of the chapter. They fear the Lord exceedingly, and they're offering sacrifices, and they're making vows. Then uh, in chapter uh, 3, we have the people of Nineveh. I want to consider them next. We're going a little bit out of order, because chapter 2 kind of gives us a little bit of Jonah's conversion, although he doesn't totally convert, but it starts. But chapter 3 um, notice when um, Jonah goes, as the word of the Lord came to him in verse 1, the second time saying, Arise and go to Nineveh in verse 2. Preach the message uh, to it that I tell you. And so verse 3, Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. And Nineveh was a great city, three days journey in extent. He began to enter the city on the first day's walk. He cried out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now, their response, verse 5, the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast. They put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. And then the word came to the king of Nineveh. And he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe and covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. So this started with a grassroots movement. It wasn't the leaders first. It was the people. The people all responded to the message. They all began to um, cry out to God. And then when the king heard about it, so then he decided that he would have a proclamation published throughout all of Nineveh by decree of the king and his nobles. He said in verse 7, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent? And turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. Now they had many gods. They worshipped many different forms of God. They worshipped the moon, the sun. They worshipped all different manner of their pleasures. These are people that were totally lost. They were idol worshippers. They don't know who God is. They don't know that he's merciful. And their, their thought is, maybe God will forgive us. We got an, we got an announcement of judgment. We know we're going to get judged. Let's cry out for mercy. Maybe there's forgiveness. So there's a complete ignorance of God. If you uh, got a message or somebody came and said, you're going to be judged, you'd say, well, I know God's a forgiving God, and I've confessed my sins to Jesus Christ, and his blood covers my sin. And in the knowledge of God, you'd have assurance of your salvation. They don't have any assurance because they have no knowledge of God. God, of course, verse 10, saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. So now we do have commentary about their conversion, that it was legitimate. They did turn from their evil way, <clears throat> and God relented from the disaster that he said he would bring upon them, and he didn't do it. I guess we could say in some sense, um, you know, once these guys tossed Jonah in the sea, God showed that you know, his judgment wasn't against the sailors, you know, the storm ceased. There was a revelation to them of, of who he was. And here to these people, 
the whole city turns to God and, and God reveals himself, there's a conversion. And then, of course, Jonah, um, chapter 2. Jonah is three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, and then, chapter 2, verse 1, then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly. So it would seem that he wasn't praying at the beginning. It would seem that he, stubborn as he was, that getting eaten by a fish was not a wake-up call. Now, before we laugh at Jonah and say, man, Jonah's really messed up, what does it take for you to have a wake-up call? What was your wake-up call? Maybe, you're, maybe yours was, maybe, you know, you're more stubborn than Jonah. You know, we have to think about, we have to be, you know, honest here. How many times have I watched somebody who got an amazing wake-up call and they're still hitting the snooze button? You know, God's doing everything to get their attention and they still won't listen. So Jonah's just like anybody, you know, he's hard-hearted and he's in the fish's belly for three days and three nights. But then look at verse 2. This is his prayer. I cried out to the Lord, notice, because of my affliction, and he answered me. Jonah's starting to have a conversion. He, he's got a hard heart. He won't listen to the Lord, but now he's got an affliction. I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction. God sent a storm, and that didn't wake him up. And so God sent a fish, and he starts to wake up. But he still doesn't wake up, and at the end, God sends a plant. It grows up and provides shade, and then the, in the next night, the plant dies, and he's the sun's beating on him and the wind comes and, and you know, God sends that hot wind and then he's all miserable. So God's still trying to get him. He's, he's converting. These other two groups, the sailors and maybe the Ninevites, they, there's like more of a quick conversion, you could say. They, they had an encounter with God and they responded and Jonah seems to be this kind of much longer process of a conversion. But he does cry out to the Lord and he says, because of my affliction, <clears throat> and God answered me. And he describes his condition uh, in the belly of the fish as very uh, poetic, but also very graphic. You know, the floods are going over my head, weeds are wrapped around my head, and billows and storms. And can you imagine what it would be like to be in the belly of a fish, trapped in the earth, and realizing, you know, that he still isn't dead, <laughs> and the fish is digesting him, and... Uh, isn't that probably not the right, great way to die, you know, like slowly? And, uh, you know, I wonder if he had any hair left. He comes out, he's just bleached maybe, you know. No eyebrows, no hair as, he's, as the stomach, you know, is working him over. Um, I mean, have you ever gone fishing? Did you ever catch a fish? Did you ever clean the fish? Did you, every, time, every time I ever clean a fish since I got saved, man, I always think the same thing when I clean the fish, like, I wonder if there's a Jonah in here, you know, and you, I, was, I always like to nick the stomach open, you know, and what did this guy eaten, you know, what has he had? And you, I always look and go, man, Jonah was in this. What's that stomach look like of a fish? I mean, this isn't like, like some cartoon fish that's got a little house in there and a little lantern, you know, and a fridge and Jonah's, this is a real fish. So, it's really this, this, this book, this little four-chapter account of, of uh, Jonah's ministry, it's really a story about conversion. It's a story about people that were, that were ignorant of God, that got to know God. And, and that's really the story of the Bible. I think that this book is a very important book. Uh, it, and, it, and also because the person who's supposed to be bringing the message that can bring about conversion is very reluctant to bring the message that will bring about conversion. And we're living in a time in, in, in our school system, in our political system, in our businesses, in our schools, our parks, our leagues, our gyms, our whatever any Americans involved in, there's a need for conversion. People are ignorant of God. They're superstitious. They're just like these sailors or like these people of Nineveh. And the Bible talks about conversion and I think we see it illustrated in the book of Jonah. And I want you to turn to a few places. I turn first to Isaiah. Isaiah is pretty easy. It's a big book. Just turn to the left a few books in your Bible, and you'll find Isaiah. And go to the Christmas verse, one of the Christmas verses, Isaiah chapter 9. We're not going to look at the Christmas part. We'll go before the Christmas this is in the section that promises a son. To, unto us a son will be born. 
A child will be born, a son will be given. But the, the, that promise begins in verse 1 of Isaiah 9. Here's, here's this promise. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed. When at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, those are the northern tribes of Israel, afterward more heavily oppressed her. But then notice, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. The whole announcement about the coming of the son that will be born, because if you jump down to verse 6, if you want to see the Christmas verse, unto us a child is born, verse 6, a son is given, the government will be upon his shoulder, his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So this is the, the section that's coming to that great, wonderful promise of the Son that will come, a prophetic word, 700 years before Jesus is born. But where will the ministry take place? Where is Jesus going? In the darkness. A place where conversion needs to happen. He's not going where there's light. He's going where it's dark. That's very important. If we want to be where Jesus is, you've got to remember Jesus goes where it's dark. That's where, that's where his ministry took place. Galilee of the Gentiles. Now, Jesus did minister in Judea, but where did, where did he pick all of his disciples? I mean, the 12 that were chosen. From what we can tell, it would seem that all of them are from Galilee. The one exception would be Judas Iscariot, who is from Cariot, which is in the south. But Judas might have been living also in Galilee. We don't know. But for sure, the bulk of them are from Galilee. He chose the men that were going to change the world from a place that's known as the Gentile place. Galilee of the Gentiles. Verse 2 again, the people who walked in darkness. You see the sailors are walking in darkness in the book of Jonah. The people of Nineveh are walking in darkness. And even Jonah himself has a hard and rebellious heart. It would be easy if Jonah was on your fantasy prophet team to trade him. You know, he's not getting you a lot of points in your league. You put him out there and go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to play Jonah this week. And, you know, and then Jonah goes the opposite way, and you get negative points, and now you're in last place, and you're like, oh, I'm going to give him another chance. And he goes in, hellfire, brimstone, you guys are dead. <laughs> and he leaves. It's not really much of a message. Walks into the city, tells them they're going to die, and then leaves the city to go on the hill to watch them die. I don't think you get any points for that either. So if we would be tempted to look at the guy and say, well, give up on him. And God's wanting to convert him. God <clears throat> wants to make a change in him. The story of the Bible is a story of a God who wants to make conversions. If you're this, he wants to make you that. And the announcement of the coming of Jesus is an announcement that Jesus is going to go to an unlikely place, a dark place, a foreign place, if you could say such a thing, and he's going to bring the light there. And a great light will shine upon them. He said in verse 2, those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death. These are the people where they're where the darkness is. The, the darkness is shining its darkness on them. They're under the shadow of it. They're blocking. They live in a place where the light's blocked. But that's where Jesus was prophesied that he was going to go. And if you'll turn over to Acts chapter 26, when Jesus is commissioning, and this is Paul recounting his commissioning by Jesus, uh, Paul, Paul's testimony, and his, Paul's conversion is recorded for us three times in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is a book of conversion. The first message that's preached, that 3,000 people are converted. And when we read about Paul's conversion, and they take the gospel everywhere, and all these different people are converted. But when Jesus is telling um, Paul, who, who at this point is just, just has met him, he, Paul's telling the story and recounting it. And I want you to look at uh, chapter 26, um, Verse 14, I guess, is where we'll start. Uh, he says, when we had all fallen to the ground, he's recounting when, this, when the light was shining and Jesus appeared to him, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. And so I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting, but rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness both of the things which you've seen and into the things which I will yet reveal to you. So, so Saul's undergoing a conversion. He's been kicking and fighting against Jesus. Is kind of get him to go in a direction, and he's kicking against the, 
the goads. The goads were the sharp sticks that the, the ranchers would use. They try to move the livestock along. They get them. They don't want to go, and so they kick. They'll kick back against the, the sharp prodding. And so, Paul, I'm trying to get you to go in a direction, and you don't want to do it. But, but not only are you going to now be you know, on the right side of things, but I'm going to actually send you out. So he's talking about his own conversion, but notice what he says in verses 17 and 18. I'm going to deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So it's very important that when we, we're living in a society that's getting more and more wicked and more and more dark and people are, are getting, giving themselves to more and more bizarre things, but we have to remember that when someone has their eyes closed, we know what God's thinking. He wants our eyes open. He's not thinking, they have their eyes closed. I hate them. <laughs> they have their eyes closed, and because they have their eyes closed, they're doing foolish and stupid things. Well, that may be true, but... Paul's being sent out to open people's eyes. People are, are, are with their eyes closed. He says to turn them from darkness into light. Jesus talked about how, he, how the lights come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Well, that was true in Jesus' day. It's true in our day. We're not surprised by that, but we're sent out in the world like the Apostle Paul was sent out into the world to turn people from darkness to light. People love darkness. So people who have their eyes closed and people who are lovers of darkness, those are the people that we're sent to. God wants to convert them. The, the church is a, is a group of people that love people who have their eyes closed and are in the darkness. We love people who love darkness. We don't hate them and want to shoot them. We want to see them get converted. It's very important that we don't lose sight of this because the world that we live in is... It's getting more and more reckless and more and more heinous. But look at the next phrase. From the power of Satan to God. There are people who are trafficking in satanic powers. They're under Satan's authority, maybe uh, blinded by him. Maybe they're just held captive by him. Maybe they're, maybe they're wanting to get out and they can't get out. But there are also other people that, that they like it and they're in it and they, they're using it. But that person still needs to be converted. It's very important for us that um, we, we don't lose sight of the heart of God at the, in the days that we're living in. Now, one of the things that happens to us is usually we're pretty gracious to people who are falling in a way where we fell. So uh, if a person, you were an alcoholic, man, you can have a real heart for the other alcoholics. Uh, I remember one time uh, being in Africa with a, with a guy uh, from Calvary Chapel, Vero Beach, good brother, Really loved this guy, and he had been an alcoholic for many years. And we were in an area where these guys were manufacturing alcohol, and there's a big still, and they were not really open to the gospel. and And I was giving it to these guys pretty hard, and they were they were kind of being pop, popping off a little bit back. And so I, you know, I started to really challenge them, you know. And so after you know this guy kind of got frustrated with me. He's like, man, you know, I was an alcoholic. And I go, I was an alcoholic too. Like, my dad's an alcoholic. My, I know what the effects are. And these guys are, these guys are just blowing off the gospel. They, I was trying to give it to them in a way where they were not going to be able to escape it. And, and he just had a real heart for that. Uh, you know, sometimes if someone was a gambler, they have a heart for the gamblers. If somebody was, you know, struggling with sexual sin, then they have a, they have a heart for somebody who's struggling in that way. But we have to remember you know, we need to have a heart for everybody. And if you were messed up in one way, just remember how messed up you were. <laughs> remember how much in bondage you were, maybe to money or was to pleasure or was it to pride, whatever it was, you were in bondage. And then let that kind of be a universal thing that you just sort of see everybody through those, that lens of, you know what, I was in bondage too. Not exactly like that person. But you know what, I was just as lost. Man, my sin was this, and this person's sin, I don't even understand it. In fact, it, it's repulsive to me, or I, I hate it. But man, we have to love people because the story of the Bible is, God, is a story that God wants to convert people. People that are in, that are in league with Satan. <laughs> They're in Satan's kingdom. 
They're doing what Satan wants them to do. And you can have a tendency naturally, even in your righteousness, like, like Lot in Sodom, where it says Lot was vexing his righteous soul. You can be, you can be in a place where you think, man, that person's doing satanic things, and, and you, can, you can have a natural reaction to it and think, that person, I need to beat them, or I need to stop them, or I need to attack them. And Paul said, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. And if someone's being used by the devil, then hate the devil and come against the devil and come against his schemes with the weapons of our warfare, which are mighty through God. But we have to keep preaching the gospel to people who are being used by the devil because God wants to convert them. God wants to see them saved. He wants them to be rescued. Someone who's under the power of Satan, under his authority, God wants to give them the forgiveness of sins. When you see somebody who's blinded and in the dark and serving Satan, you can know what God wants to do in that person's life. And it's not send them to hell. <laughs> it's save this person. Save them. They need to get saved. Now, uh, turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 because we're, we're talking about this bondage of Satan. And, and Paul tells the Corinthians, and they're, you know, we're studying 1 Corinthians on Sunday, so we've got a little bit of the background in our minds. It's fresh. This is a very immoral place. It's a notorious place. Uh, the secular writers write about the, the, no, the nature of this city as being a place where you'd go, uh, where anything goes. You can find anything that you want. You can do anything that you want. If you've got the money, you can do anything that you want in this place. It's all there. And it's, and it's known around the world as that place. And these are the Christians that are living in this place. So we've got this mentality you know, in our mind of this background. And so Paul's talking about how, how his ministry is received in verse 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. He says, even if our gospel is veiled, and to some people it seems like they can't see it, even if it is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who don't believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So there are people who are, who are living, and you try to share with them, and it's like there's a veil. They, you say, man, can't you see how much God loves you? And it's like they're looking through this curtain. And they think, no, I don't see how God loves me. I don't really care. I don't need God's love. I'm totally fine. And you look at them and think, you're totally depressed. A minute ago, you were complaining about your life. And once I start to preach the gospel, all of a sudden, you have the greatest life ever. <laughs> Five seconds ago, you were talking about how everyone's against you, and now when I start preaching the gospel, you you're, you know, happy as a clam. I mean, you've got amnesia? Like, or what, what's going on? Well, they're blinded. The God of this age blinds people so that they can't see. We have to pray for people's eyes to be open. Paul says in verse 5, and really verse 6 is the one I want to get to. Paul says in verse 5, We don't preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. We, we preach to people who are in the darkness and who are blinded for this reason. Verse 6. Because it's the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness who's shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. We preach Christ Jesus because God can bring light into darkness. And the analogy, the biblical analogy, the biblical reference point that Paul would give to us as an encouragement is when God first spoke and said, let there be light and light came out of darkness. Well, we were building this building. We were careful about the lighting. We wanted to be able to have uh, uh, an environment that was comfortable, an environment that would be uh, able to help people facilitate you know, worship. Um, so we were very careful. We, had, we brought electricity from the one part of our building where it enters the building on that end, and we brought this massive, you know, gigantic bundle of wires to the center of the building, where then all the power gets dispersed to the whole building. We want people to be able to see. Well, we had light. Well, we started with something. There's some kind of power plant somewhere that's generating the electricity, and we brought it to the building, and then we dispersed it through the building. Well, we, we said, let there be light, and there was light. But we started with something, and it was pretty exciting when we installed everything and got it all set up and saw how it worked the night before our first service. Do you guys remember back then? That was pretty exciting. We were grinding the last few days. But, um, you know, we let there be light, and there was light. Well, we were, we were beginning with something. When, in, in Genesis, when God says, let there be light, what's the beginning point? There's nothing. I mean, 
Light where there's no, there's no reason for any light. There's no light source. It's just God spoke. And because God said it, now there was. It happened. Now this is very interesting because as we understand physics today, light is kind of the standard. The speed of light is the standard. If you get to the speed of light, mass no longer behaves like mass. It turns into energy. Um, time seems to change at the speed of light. I mean, what we understand of it, our, our angle from where we're at, our reference point looking at it, time becomes different at the speed of light. Light is the standard, but then we think, well, here's this ancient book, and what's the first thing? Let there be light. And what's, what do we, now we are 6,000 years later, if you go by a biblical time calendar, and here we are going, we've discovered that light is the basis. I think, okay, genius, you know, like Genesis 1-1, you know, go back to the beginning. In the beginning, there's God, and God said, let there be light. Well, where's that light coming from? It's not coming from the sun, because the sun hasn't been made yet. It's not coming from all the planets, because it hasn't happened. God declared it, and so it was. Out of nothing came something. It's an amazing miracle. So Paul says, that's the standard. So now we've got a person who has all the capacity of light. The light has shined in the world. Jesus Christ has come. The gospel message has already been preached all around the world. You know, millions and millions of people have accepted Christ. And now here we are, 2015, and we're sitting at a, at a coffee table with a friend who doesn't know Jesus. And man, the light, God could command that light to shine in their hearts. That's what Paul says in verse 6. God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. We preach the gospel because God does miracles and the light shines in people's hearts and they're converted. We believe in conversion. People that were blinded by Satan or who are in love with the darkness or who are running away from God or who have hard hearts, we preach Jesus Christ to them because if light can come out of nothing, because God said it, how about when there's a hard, dead heart? Can God not shine in that person's heart and give them new life? He can. That's what Paul's telling the Corinthians. They were living in a very dark place like we are. Don't forget, don't think for a moment if you're preaching and you see that people are, are, their hearts are veiled, pray for the enemy to be bound from them. If you've got loved ones, people in your life, and you want to preach the gospel, then pray that God would open their eyes. Pray that God would, would take away that blinding power that Satan's uh, exercising in their life and say, Lord, open their eyes and then tell them about Jesus and they'll be converted. That's the story of the Bible. Turn to Ephesians, if you would. Ephesians chapter 2. Look at this description of people who are lost. And Paul's describing you know, what these people Believers now in Ephesus, they're now believers, they've been converted, but what, what, ha, what their life had been like, verse 11, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11, therefore remember that you, so you guys can remember what you used to be like, you were once Gentiles in the flesh. Now notice this, this list here, what you're like. You're called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hand, that at that time you were without Christ, that's the first one, you're aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, second one. You're strangers from the covenants of promise, third one. You had no hope, fourth one. You were without God in the world. And there's a fifth one, in, or sixth one in verse 13. You once were far off. Look at that list. You were without Christ. You didn't have a Savior. You were superstitious like the sailors on the boat. You got out your little Buddha. You rubbed his belly. You put some food at his feet. No, that didn't help. And you got out your candles and you lit them and you said a prayer to that person who supposedly will speak to God on your behalf and that didn't do anything. And then you got the incense, like, isn't this the right incense? Do you put this like this? And you, you did whatever thing you could do. You, you had the idea, well, it must be somebody's fault. Just left with whatever you think it might be. Trying without Christ. You don't know. Don't know Christ. Uh, he reminds them that they were once called the uncircumcision. They were, they were outside of the promises of God to Israel. You know, it's, it's interesting. We go back and study the Old Testament, and you think about the, uh, the, the 
condemnation that's there for the Gentiles. Now, the, obviously, the rabbis took it to an extreme. I think there's some rabbis who, you know, taught that the Gentiles were only created to fuel the fires of hell. Now, that's not in the Old Testament, but uh, there's plenty of promises for God wanting to do a work for the nations, even Abraham. I'll make you a blessing to all nations. And that wasn't just that, that Israel will come and there'll be a nation and we can all look at how great they are and that will bless us. But that God meant that his son would come from Abraham, that Jesus would be a blessing for everyone. But that being said, those promises that are for Israel, they're for Israel. They're not for us. They're not for the United States of America. You know that wonderful promise that people are always quoting, you know, if my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, then, then I will heal their land. That's not a promise to America. That's a promise to Israel. If Israel will do that, then Israel will have that. Now, we know about God. Now, what happened in Nineveh when they humbled themselves and they prayed? Well, they got delivered. So if we humble ourselves, and we, we know on, the, on a different basis, but not that promise. That promise is for Israel. So we're strangers of these covenants. He says, no hope. You had no hope. Isn't it encouraging when you, you go to your teacher and you say, you know, I'm doing the best I can. I'm doing everything I can. How, come, how can I get a better grade in this math class? And the teacher said, you have no hope. You just, you're just not good at it. Coach, I want to get in the game. I want to be able to play. You know, what do I need to do to be a starter? Grow a foot. I mean, you know, you need to be eight inches taller. Or you're just, just not going to happen for you. You know, you need, to, you need to be able to bench this much. You need to be able to run this fast. You need to be able to score this score on the test. You need to be able to memorize things like this. I mean, you know, you just don't have any hope. But when it comes to spiritual things, superstition, Try harder. Job's, the counsel of Job's friends to Job, how, how encouraging is that? That's the best the world has. You must have done something, man. Just admit it. We know that. We, we always knew that something was wrong with you. Sad. No hope. Without God in the world. Far off. But now in Christ Jesus, though you were far off, verse 13 said, now you've been brought near by the blood of Christ. Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22 said, you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Yet now he's reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. You see, the people that are alienated and enemies of God by wicked works, those are the ones God wants to reconcile. So as you're watching the news or you're scrolling through your Facebook you know, feed, looking at all this craziness that's going on in the world, or you're paying attention to what's happening in the world, and you're looking at it, and you find yourself getting fired up, be really careful. Because the message of the Bible is conversion. It's not kill the bad people and make a great country with only us good people living in it. That's a natural reaction, though, when people are doing crazy stuff. The natural reaction is to say, man, we've got to stop this from happening. How are you going to stop it from happening, Christian? What's the Bible's answer? How do you stop it from happening? You preach the gospel. You preach about Jesus Christ so people can be converted because they're blind. And so the light has to shine. And you say, well, I preach to them, but man, their hearts are so hard. Well, then pray that God will soften their heart. Pray for God to take away the veil. Pray that God will open their eyes. Pray that God will take away that authority that Satan's having. God will just snatch it away and their eyes will be able to open. If God could speak light when there was only darkness, then he could, he could speak light into a hard heart. I think that when I, when I think of the book of, of Jonah, to me it's just such a powerful illustration of conversion. We have Jonah's in-process conversion that's happening like a, like a teenager learning to drive a manual transmission. <laughs> Installs, you know, he, he lurches forward and stalls and lurches forward and then reverses. You know, he, he's struggling. But man, we have these sailors, these, these guys, these people and the people in Nineveh, the Assyrians. You couldn't have an example of people more lost, alienated and enemies in their mind by wicked works, without God in the world, with no hope, strangers to the covenants of promise, lost. But God sends us out into the world to the people who are in darkness and in the and living in the shadow of death, that's, the, that's what Jesus did, that's what we're doing. So, you know, may the Holy Spirit give you vision for your life. You don't have to be Billy Graham, you don't have to be an evangelist 
But all of us do the work of an evangelist. All of us need to do the work of an evangelist. None of us are off the hook. God has a plan for all of us. He wants to use us. Now, you have a sphere of people that you can touch that no one else is touching, and God wants to use you to preach about Jesus to them so that they could be converted because God wants to convert people. And so don't be ashamed of that. If someone says, well, you Christians are always trying to convert people. Exactly. Well, you finally got it. That's what we, you bet that's what we're trying to do. I'm trying to convert you because you have no hope. I'd like you to have hope. You're, you're in the power of Satan. I want you to be under the power of God. You're, you're, you're dwelling in darkness. I want you to be in the light. Yeah, I'm trying to convert you. You bet I'm trying to convert you. Father, help us. We thank you, Lord, as you uh, mentioned to Paul, uh, commissioning him, that you reminded him of his own conversion. Uh, thank you, Lord, for emphasizing in the New Testament his conversion story, that he was a model of patience. Lord, fill us with patience. Give us patience, Lord. Give us grace. Fill us with love. Fill us, Lord, with so much love for people that are lost. Lord, as our day gets darker, we're going to need more love. I'm speaking for myself, Lord. I need more love. I know it. I feel it today, Lord. I need more love. I need more grace, Lord. I need more patience. I need more boldness. Jesus, you, you were trying to get Jonah to go to a very wicked people because you wanted to rescue them. And you were trying to work in Jonah's life because you wanted to rescue him. You were trying to reach into those sailors' lives because you wanted to rescue them. We thank you, Lord, that your story is always a story of rescue. And so, Jesus, pour out your spirit on us and make us witnesses of you. Help us to preach the message about Jesus, about you, Jesus, what you did, who you are and what you did, and what you want to do in someone's life. And Lord, give us power. And we pray that you'd bind Satan, bind his power, stop him, Lord, nullify him. As his, he's working to blind people, Lord, break that power and open people's eyes, awaken people to their need for Jesus. Like maybe Jonah had said, in my affliction I cried out, or those sailors <clears throat> in the storm they cried out, or the people of Nineveh in the announcement of judgment there was an awakening. Lord, let there be an awakening in the people around us, Lord, and then give us boldness to preach about Jesus. Not any other message, not a political message, not a righteousness or moral message but a message of the blood of Jesus Christ, the death and the resurrection of God's only Son and salvation in His name. Lord, do a work. Do a work, we pray. Use our lives. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, may the Lord help us. Uh, may we not be like Jonah, not the reluctant. Um, may we... May we uh, just keep our eyes open and see how God may want to glorify himself through us. Amen?